Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, greetings from Geneva. Um, once again, it's Tony Consul, Head of Communications here at IATA. Um, I'm joined by Willie Walsh, our Director General, and Brian Pierce, our Chief Economist. Um, for this week's press briefing, uh, we've got a couple of topics. Um, so Brian Pierce will start us off by looking at the cargo and passenger traffic results for March. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Willie Walsh, our Director General, uh, to talk a bit more broadly about some of the restart issues, in particular, uh, the cost of testing. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Brian. Uh, thank you, Tony, and good day to everybody. Um, if we can move to the next slide, let me start on cargo in March, because um, we've seen very much a V-shaped uh, recovery for airlines in the air cargo market. And in fact, in March, we saw the ton kilometers flown reach new record highs. Um, and clearly this reflects the what we're seeing happening outside of the travel and tourism sector in the wider economy, which is uh, a strong economic recovery. But there's another, another factor in that um, at the beginnings of economic upturns, uh, companies, shippers turn to air cargo to get their products around very quickly and importantly to support their global supply chains um, and, and of course the shipping of the of the vaccines um, so that's driving air cargo um, we would expect that uh, to continue but if we look at the next slide it, it does differ depending on where your airline is based and as you can see here from uh, what's happened to those cargo time kilometers by the region of registration of the airline. And what was the striking thing here, I think, is the contrast between the experience of airlines in North America and those in Latin America. Um, you know, booming conditions in North America for those airlines, uh, whereas in, for the Latin American airlines, you know, still perhaps, you know, 20 percent down on where they were pre-crisis. Um, and in many ways, that reflects um, government support, actually, because um, sometimes both of those uh, airlines in those regions are working on the same markets, um, which are, are up generally. Um, the Latin America situation really reflects the fact that airlines, the major cargo carriers in that region are going through a process of restructuring now, and they've cut that capacity uh, fairly dramatically. Um, but as I say, generally, the picture for cargo is good. However, for most airlines and for the industry, that's not a big enough business to offset what we've seen in the passenger business, which if you move to the next slide, um, you can see what's happened to passenger kilometers flown. Um, the red line shows the actual numbers. The blue dotted line shows an adjustment for the seasonal ups and downs. I mean, what you can see, March was a good month, well, a better month, uh, for air travel and for airlines passenger business. We saw RPKs globally reach a point where they were just over 67% down on pre-crisis levels the same month uh, in 2019. That's better than February. But as you can see, um, you know, if you adjust for you know, what's normally a better month in March, the blue line shows you know, we really haven't seen very much of an improvement. The travel market globally is really moving sideways at the moment at a pretty depressed level. Um, but let's dig into those numbers. And if we move to the next slide, you can see that the domestic situation is, is very different to the international air travel situation, the blue line. In fact, we saw in March a sharp recovery um, a sharp rebound in domestic air travel. Um, you know what we saw in March and, and the weak numbers in the previous two months for domestic RPKs it was really what's happening in China, the big Chinese domestic market. Uh, if you recall, the Chinese government uh, uh, asked everyone to stay at home during the Chinese uh, New Year, uh, and essentially we've seen as case numbers of coronavirus have been. Uh, really kept contained after uh, you know, a, a rise in the early couple of months of the year. And so we've seen a full rebound above fourth quarter levels, and we're expecting to see further growth um, in that market. Um, huge contrast, though, with what's happening on international markets, where 
um, international air travel is still almost 88% lower than where it was uh, pre-crisis. Um, and if we can move to the next slide, I mean, the reason, of course, being that we have seen in February and March a pretty severe deterioration in the coronavirus, the COVID-19 control. Uh, we've seen a big rise of cases over that period, which in many markets are only just in um, in late April starting to decline. Um, you know, and I guess the most striking thing about the picture for new cases of of COVID-19 is this, uh, you know, it's incredible deterioration, incredible rise in cases um, in the India uh, market. But obviously, this situation is uh, is keeping governments being very risk averse in terms of opening their borders uh, to to inbound inbound travellers. More on that um, in a bit. Uh, but I guess the question is, you know, is that surge of case that that incredible surge of cases in India, what's that going to do to the air passenger numbers? And if we move to the next slide, I think the point is, if we look at the Indian domestic market, which has been building substantially over recent years, the yellow line at the bottom shows it's still a relatively small market. So in March, uh, it represented just 3% of global RPKs. The, the big drivers of the industry numbers for domestic air travel, and, and that really drives total air travel at the moment, are China and the US which you can see here. These are their domestic markets. Um, as we said earlier, the Chinese domestic market has fully recovered from that a very sharp fall in January and February uh, and looks set to get you know back well above uh, pre-crisis levels in the second half of this year. The other big market is the US, um, which is because of the the very fast rollout of the vaccination program in, in the US um, is also set, I think, to uh, get back to full recovery later this year. And what we can see has happened in the last few months is a steady improvement. Um, and essentially, those two markets are driving the numbers. Um, so just quickly looking ahead, or rather looking at what we would expect to happen in in the April and May numbers. The next slide shows bookings uh, by booking dates for future travel. And I guess the obvious point from this is the sharp rise that we've seen in domestic bookings um, over the March and April period. You know, so we're back, you know, not that far away from pre-crisis levels of bookings for domestic air travel, which suggests that you know, April and May are looking pretty positive for domestic air travel. I think the problem, as ever, is international. We've seen a little bit of a rise, but really bookings for international air travel remain um, exceptionally uh, weak as a result of both the virus and the travel restriction situation. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, with that, uh, I'll now turn it over to our Director General, Willie Walsh, uh, for a few comments before we take your questions. Um, and just a reminder, we'll take questions through the chat function, so uh, please type them in and we'll get to them as soon as Willie's finished with his remarks. Willie, over to you. Well, thank you, Tony, and uh, thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so as Brian's presentation has shown you, once again, we're seeing a strong performance from cargo. Uh, which I think is very encouraging for a number of reasons. Uh, it clearly demonstrates the importance of air freight in the uh, global supply chain and the role that air freight has played in ensuring that that kept moving through this particular crisis, uh, especially as, as we've talked about before, a lot of air freight would normally travel in the belly hold of passenger aircraft. So strong cargo performance. And uh, again, we're witnessing uh, clear evidence that uh, demand for air travel exists, as evidenced by the performance in the domestic markets. Uh, and again, uh, Brian's chart shows um, a strong performance in domestic markets in the uh, US and China. Uh, I think there's every reason to be confident that those domestic markets 
will uh, return to pre pre crisis levels pretty soon. So airlines operate in markets where they have a strong domestic market, uh, and that's particularly true of China, US. Um, Russia and I suppose uh, Australia as well, where uh, it's big market uh, with a limited number of players. Uh, those airlines will benefit from the uh, performance of domestic markets, but it also gives great encouragement to airlines operating in the international markets, uh, where uh, demand has once again been heavily suppressed by government restrictions. That uh, once those restrictions are relaxed or removed, uh, we will see a strong rebound uh, and that gives us uh, the confidence that we expressed the last time we spoke about the um, stronger performance in the second half of this year. Also, um, it's worth noting that a number of countries, I think at this stage 24 countries, have indicated that they are likely to open their borders where customers can show evidence of uh, vaccination. And we were pleased to see the recommendation coming from the EU uh, Commission yesterday, uh, which highlighted uh, a new approach, uh, a combination of approaches actually. One, uh, where they talked about uh, removing restrictions for people who can show evidence of vaccination, uh, particularly those who have uh, used vaccines authorised by the EU, but also made reference to the WHO emergency list. But secondly, uh, talking about countries with a good epidemiological uh, performance, and they've changed the criteria from uh, 25 uh, per 100,000 in the 14-day average to 100 per 100,000 14-day average. Uh, so it's a combination of both. I'm not just saying that uh, you have to be vaccinated and it's critical actually that we continue to make that point that uh, vaccination should not be the only key to reopening international travel. Uh, we believe that as the vaccine rollout, uh, which is clearly having a strong um, impact on the suppression of uh, transmission as evidenced by the scientific data that we're seeing, uh, that that should enable countries to uh, remove some of the restrictions that they have in place. And we accept that uh, testing uh, will continue to have a role to play in the uh, short to medium term. The important issue for us, though, is the cost of testing. And I've got a couple of slides uh, just to show you some research that uh, we have undertaken at IATA. Uh, and this is um, recent research, 16 different countries of the cost of testing, PCR testing. And you can see an incredible variation both within country and across the 16 countries that uh, we've looked at. Uh, clearly, you know, th th this is unjustifiable. Um, we've talked about evidence of profiteering. Uh, I don't think you need to look further than this chart to see that there's clear evidence of this. Uh, only one country, and I think uh, credit to France, because uh, France has implemented the WHO recommendation that the cost of testing should be borne by the country. Uh, that is a recommendation that governments have signed up to under WHO, uh, but as you can see, that's not being implemented uh, by those that we've looked at here with the exception of France. And I think France, and to a lesser degree, the EU is now leading the way. Uh, but when we look at the evidence here, uh, it's clear to us that uh, these costs will impact on demand. And uh, if I just move to the next chart, uh, we can see here based on some averages of uh, ticket prices. So the average ticket price, um, as you can see there in the pre-crisis, one way was 200 uh, US dollars. Uh, now, significantly, the average short-haul flight, uh, and we've defined that for the time being as flights of up to 1,100 kilometres, that average was 105 uh, US dollars. So you can see from this that somebody travelling on a, a short-haul uh, flight where they're faced with the cost of uh, PCR testing, and this is looking at the averages of the lower ends, uh, 90 US dollars per test, that the, the cost of the test is going to uh, you know, be very, very significant and um, in many cases will be greater 
and, and indeed in some cases significantly greater than the cost of the ticket. And then if you look at the impact that this would have on a family of four, uh, the real risk here is that these prohibitive costs will prevent people, families, from exercising their freedom to travel, to visit friends, to take a holiday. Uh, and we cannot, as a society, we, we just cannot allow that situation to develop where only the rich can afford to travel again. Um, the deregulation in the air transport market has been fantastic benefit for consumers, uh, not just for those who want to travel to see their family or to take a holiday, but also facilitating people who have to work in uh, different countries from where they're originally from, or indeed people doing business. So we continue to uh, highlight the uh, excessive costs of PCR testing. Uh, we will continue to uh, provide research to support our belief that much of this testing can be um, adequately uh, replaced by lateral flow, uh, uh, antigen testing, which is just as effective from a risk management point of view, but significantly cheaper. And we also need to highlight the fact that uh, governments continue to mandate these tests, but are taking their big slice of the pie through uh, VAT charges. Uh, so as I said, there's uh, no evidence uh, other than to uh, demonstrate that uh, people are being gouged uh, by these high prices. Uh, we estimate that the actual cost of a PCR test is less than 15 US dollars. Uh, we're still doing research into the actual cost, uh, but I, I think there's clear evidence of very significant markups here. So um, we're pleased to see uh, that uh, the evidence in the domestic markets uh, continues to support our belief that there will be a, a recovery in international travel. We're pleased to see that countries are now looking at opening their borders to people who have been vaccinated. We're pleased to see that the vaccination uh, rollout, which is uh, accelerating, is having an impact on transmission plenty of scientific evidence to support that uh, statement. And we're uh, optimistic that we will see a relaxation in the uh, current restrictions and that that relaxation will enable international travel to recommence and fulfil uh, the strong demand that we believe exists uh, once we get into the uh, latter part of the uh, second quarter of this year and moving into the second half of next year. So on that, I'm going to hand back to Tony uh, to manage your uh, questions. Thank you, Tony. Great. Um, thanks very much, Willie. Uh, we've got a few questions in the queue. Um, so just a reminder, if you do have questions, uh, please type them into the chat function. Um, the first question that we have um, has several parts to it. So uh, the first is asking for uh, our how we would view the UK and the EU reopening plans, um, if there's any comparison or um, best practice in either either one of those that we'd like to highlight. So maybe for you, Willie. Yeah, I think um, the positive... Sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, there we go. Um, I think the positive from the uh, EU Commission is that they've clearly identified two pathways to opening. And there appears to be clear evidence of a desire to reopen their borders. The first is acknowledging that people who have been vaccinated uh, should have greater freedom. And the second is that as the vaccines have an effect in suppressing transmission, uh, we should see the 14-day uh, averages uh, begin to uh, lower. Uh, and also, I'm pleased that they have recognised that um, you know, managing risk is a critical issue. Uh, having set the uh, bar now at 100 per 100,000, 14 day average, that's uh, an improvement on where they were at uh, 25 per 100,000. So I think all of this points to evidence of governments recognising that they have been too conservative uh, in the past and they need to keep building on the confidence that they have and build on the clear scientific evidence of the impact of the vaccine rollout 
to enable borders to reopen. I think we wait to see what the UK uh, will do in terms of identifying criteria that they will apply for the traffic light uh, system. Uh, you know, there's no point in having a traffic light system if the lights are stuck on red. Uh, so, you know, we will want to see uh, clear evidence of uh, the UK government being driven by the science as well, accepting that this is about uh, managing risk and accepting that there is a, a level of ri risk which is um, normal or acceptable in the circumstances. Uh, but all of this, uh, I think, points to a, uh, a change and a positive change in direction from governments, uh, which we welcome. Okay, thanks, Willie. Um, we also have a, another part to that question, which is asking about progress on the US to UK market. Um, and the question would be, do you think potentially that could open up in advance of say UK to Europe? Um, and any other insights you have on how those discussions are going? Well, we, we know that uh, the UK and US governments are in dialogue with one another. Uh, I think there is a good reason to believe that uh, the UK and US, given the very uh, positive impact of the vaccine rollout, and in the case of the UK, uh, the significantly lower 14-day uh, average, I, I think it's now somewhere in the order, in fact, I have it written down here, uh, 46 uh, per 100,000 uh, on the 14-day average. So that that's a very uh, significant improvement. The US is still above... Uh, 200, I think the last figure I saw, I'm just checking, it was 259. Uh, but the vaccine rollout is having a, a positive uh, effect there. And that is encouraging. And I think given some of the statements that we've seen attributed to politicians on both sides of the pond, uh, we should be optimistic about uh, UK, US transatlantic activity getting going again, and probably uh, in advance of uh, the end of June. Okay, thanks, Willie. Um, I have a question for Brian, um, and that question is on the performance of premium or business travel in the domestic recovery, um, particularly what's going on in China and the US. Any insights on, on how that's developing, Brian? Well, I think we're, we're, we're seeing that airlines have partly managed to stimulate the, the travel um, by very low fares, um, you know, particularly in the Chinese market, we've we've seen uh, the average yield down thirty or forty percent, thirty or forty percent. Um, so it's and it's the you know it's 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 mostly leisure and VFR travel. We are starting to see some business travel um, on domestic markets, but the premium market um, is is you know is is, is lagging and, and average yields. Um, are much lower than pre-crisis levels, which is obviously a challenge uh, for airlines to both to stop their burning of cash, um, but also to support some of the markets which had relied on uh, premium paying business passengers. You know, we think there will be some delay before we get a full recovery of, of business travel. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, we have a, a question about vaccine passes. Um, and the question is, how concerned are we about uh, the potential for fraud? Uh, and how confident are we that we will have the global standards uh, to allow vaccine passports to be recognized uh, in various jurisdictions? So, Willie, maybe that one's for you. Yeah, um, thank you, Tony. But be before I answer, let me just uh, go back to the last question as well. I think it's important for people to remember but when you talk about premium, it's not necessarily the same as business. Uh, there is business travel in the economy cabin and business travel in the premium cabin. And there is a lot of leisure travel in premium cabins. And I, I speak from my personal experience in previous roles, uh, particularly in, in British Airways. So I think we need to uh, continue to differentiate between business related travel and leisure, and leisure is both in the premium and non-premium cabins. Now, going to the issue of uh, vaccine certification, uh, I think we will see um, some countries that will have very clear security around this. Uh, I think the development in the EU of the uh, digital green certificate is a very positive development, and uh, we're confident that that will be in place uh, with sufficient time to enable the recovery 
Uh, also in the UK, you clearly have a central database under the National Health System, the NHS, uh, that uh, again is secure and accurate. So I think in many jurisdictions, there will be uh, databases that are secure, very credible and will prevent fraud. Uh, in, in other areas, there's work to be done, uh, but I think that will be factored in by governments. So it won't be for the industry to determine whether uh, there's uh, sufficient security because we will only be carrying people that are authorised by uh, governments. So uh, ultimately it's going to be for governments to ensure that they have uh, sufficient security around their uh, vaccination certificates. We're clearly not going to uh, accept uh, a vaccine that's been issued by you know, Mr. Joe Smith um, based in a uh, small warehouse uh, somewhere in the world. Uh, you know, these will be done on a very professional and secure basis. And we are confident that uh, this will be in place. But again, I have to stress, we're not just looking at vaccination to enable the restart of uh, the international travel. It will be clear that as the vaccine rollout on a countrywide basis starts impacting significantly on the rates of uh, virus um, cases, uh, and uh, as we've seen in the case of the UK, you know, significantly uh, reducing the average, uh, either on a 14-day or seven-day uh, basis. You know, there will be clear evidence that vaccines are having uh, a positive impact, and I think again that will enable governments to manage this uh, this on an acceptable risk basis and where there isn't confidence in vaccine certification, uh, continue to have some uh, form of uh, testing in place until we see evidence on a global basis of uh, low levels of uh, virus transmission. Okay, um, thanks, Willie. Um, we have another question on vaccines. Um, and for example, the in Europe, the uh, admission of vaccinated travelers will be limited to those using vaccines that are um, I suppose, recognized by the European authorities or potentially on the WHO list. But there are a number of vaccines that are being administered in different parts of the world um, that are on neither of those two lists. So I guess the first part of the question is, how serious of an issue do you think that is? I, I don't think that's really a, a serious issue because I, I think we have to consider that there are vaccines currently on the list and there are vaccines being assessed. Uh, and, you know, if there's evidence of the uh, quality of the vaccine being at a level that's acceptable under WHO or under EU regulations, then uh, these uh, vaccines will be added to the list. So I think it's normal for a process to exist where uh, people can have data to support the decisions. And in fact, that's what we're asking for. We're, we're asking for governments to make decisions based on uh, evidence, data and fact rather than uh, anecdotal and we're confident that as more data becomes available uh, to support uh, the addition of uh, other vaccines to the list that that will happen. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a, a question on um, the potential situation at borders. So um, the, the question is basically looking at uh, the potential time that we would take for document checking by border force officials and also, I suppose, by airline check-in staff. Um, what's the best way to prevent long queues and avoid that crowding that could uh, be conducive to transmission of, of the virus? Yeah, it's a great question and it highlights the, uh, um, you know, the risk. What we don't want are queues at check-in desks and uh, queues at immigration. And that's why it's important that uh, we continue with the development and testing that we're doing with the IATA travel pass and, and other uh, forms of uh, you know, digital uh, processing of uh, the data. Um, that's absolutely critical to enable large volumes of people to travel. Now, on the positive side, I, I have traveled uh, quite a bit uh, recently over the last few months. I've not personally encountered any problems at immigration. Uh, I've been through Heathrow, I think, on three occasions now, 
and uh, have not uh, witnessed any particular issues. I know there are stories of uh, long queues, which uh, clearly are, are unacceptable. Uh, but my personal experience of uh, traveling in, uh, in through a number of countries uh, over the past few months um, has, has not been that bad. What is important, though, is that we put in place measures to ensure that we avoid these long queues. Now, the IATA travel pass uh, will certainly facilitate uh, customers departing, you know, their interaction with the airline where they can, uh, um, you know, integrate the IATA travel pass into the airline app and enable them to uh, continue to check in online and the airline will have uh, security that the uh, passenger has complied with the regulations. Uh, clearly, it will be for governments to determine whether they're uh, willing to accept uh, this for evidence on arrival as well. I, I think that will happen because we are interacting with a, a number of governments who have shown a significant interest in working with IATA and accepting the uh, travel pass. So I, I think we're, we're, we should all be working together. Nobody wants to see uh, unacceptable cues, be it on departure or on arrival. We should all be working to a common agenda to ensure that uh, we avoid creating a risk of transmission, uh, however small that may be. Uh, so uh, I'm optimistic that we will have the appropriate measures in place and we continue to see very positive feedback from the airlines that engaged with the IATA Travel Pass and very valuable feedback from customers who are using it, which will enable us to uh, refine the travel pass to ensure that it's uh, uh, um, very effective when we see high volumes of passengers traveling again. Okay, thanks, Willie. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the summer and what the potential for the summer travel season would be for the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so the question is basically, how optimistic are you about the summer and compared to 2019 at what levels do you think we might be able to reach? So I'll, I'll comment and I'll let uh, Brian comment. Uh, he's the economist. And I'm not going to um, say anything bad about economists other than they can never agree with one another and they never quite get it right. Uh, but Brian is, as I've said many times, he's the, the best economist in the industry and, and knows a lot about uh, our industry, in fact, better than anybody else. Personally, I am optimistic. Um, my optimism comes from what we witnessed last summer when restrictions were removed, what we're witnessing in the domestic markets where we, uh, restrictions don't exist, what we're seeing in terms of the uh, evidence of the vaccine rollout having a significant impact on suppressing transmission, and what we're seeing in uh, relation to the evidence of when the vaccine rollout will reach uh, critical uh, levels in terms of vaccinations uh, across Europe. So I think we should be optimistic. Um, we're heading in the right direction. We're seeing evidence of governments looking at uh, changing their uh, policies. And I, I think that all uh, supports uh, the view that we will see a recovery starting um, in, in the next uh, month or so, but certainly being in place for the second half of this year. The, the critical issue that we've been identifying is that government should really be giving the industry some notice of their intention to remove these restrictions so that airlines can start building up their schedules and getting their people back in place, because that's not going to be easy. Many airlines have furloughed uh, most, if not all, of their pilots, and it will take time to retrain and bring them back up to uh, required levels of currency. Uh, so the more lead-in time we have available, the better airlines will be to be able to take advantage of the recovery. But maybe uh, Brian would uh, like to comment. Yeah, I think that um, uh, you know, for, for, we've certainly seen the strength of demand to travel on domestic markets and on some international markets because of the vaccination, because of the the tools being developed like the travel pass, you know, we should be able to see at least some markets opened uh, for, for the summer. Indeed, in, a, in the forecast that we released a couple of weeks ago, you know, we, we see intra-European travel going from current levels of perhaps 20% you know, or less of normal levels to 50%. Um, so 
I think I think that we do have the ingredients in place for some early revival. Um, but obviously, there are some markets, for instance, in, in Asia, where governments are taking a very risk averse um, approach, and, and that will probably be you know, slower to open there. Okay. Th thanks, Brian and Willie. Um, we have uh, an, another question, um, which is looking at the specific market situation, which is the UK to uh, US. Um, and the questioner notes that a, le a letter from many organizations was sent to both governments asking for the development of a travel corridor. Uh, and specifically, what are the what's the status of those talks? I know, Willie, you spoke about it a bit earlier, but um, is there any further comment that you could give around that? Well, we're clearly pleased to see the industry coming together to encourage both uh, President Biden and uh, Prime Minister Johnson uh, to consider a travel corridor between the UK and the US. Uh, we were signatory uh, to that letter, but I think it shows uh, the united na uh, nature of the uh, airline industry. We all want to see this going. I, I think it will send a very strong signal to the world uh, that uh, we are getting back to uh, a more normal environment. And I think that's a message that uh, a lot of governments want to send out. Clearly, it has to be timed appropriately, but given the huge investment in uh, testing that governments have made, the investment in vaccinations, the uh, acceleration of the vaccine uh, rollout, um, the promises that were made by governments that this would enable us to get back to a, a normal way of living, the promises that were made are around removing restrictions uh, if the vaccines were uh, sufficiently uh, effective, and it's very clear evidence that that is the case. Uh, I think that will be important, therefore, to the governments to follow through on their statements. And uh, I think that's particularly true of the UK and the US. It's a very important transatlantic market. And uh, we're, you know, I think the, the best thing we can say is it's good that the governments are talking to one another. Uh, that's significantly better than if they're not. And I uh, have uh, good reason to believe that there is uh, evidence that they want to look at a sensible way of reopening that market. And that will send a very strong signal to other markets as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Brian, you spoke a lot about uh, the recovery being led by domestic markets. There are airlines in many parts of the world, including uh, the Gulf area, where you have very small domestic markets, but very large international operations. So the questioner is asking specifically for Gulf, but maybe you can comment more broadly uh, about other markets as well. What's the prognosis for airlines that don't have domestic markets to prop, uh, prop up their business in the recovery phase? Well, I, th I think it's, I mean, we, we've already seen the benefits to airlines with big domestic markets. I mean, the North American airlines are seeing both, both in terms of the recovery in their business, but also in terms of their financial position, um, you know, quite a sharp improvement. Um, for those regions like the Gulf, like Europe, um, which rely very much on international markets, you know, clearly it's going to be a slower path uh, to, to recovery. Uh, but we know that the restriction on that recovery are, are, are put in are, are the travel restrictions and so uh, it, it is important that governments are able to lower those as quickly as the vaccination and the, and the testing uh, regimes uh, allow because um, you know many airlines have raised very large sums of cash that will enable them to survive through uh, you know e even you know several more quarters of weak international passenger markets but over that period they'll be burning through cash and it will add to the debt problem that they'll have to deal with uh, uh, as they come out of that okay uh Willie, did you have anything you wanted to add to that no i i would uh, just uh, agree with what uh, brian has said um so you know the uh, I, I think let's take encouragement from the fact that uh, domestic travel shows that people will travel will fly when the restrictions are removed and that that's uh, you know will help 
to uh, convince everybody that the recovery in the airline industry will uh, take place when uh, we see these uh, current restrictions relaxed. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a, a slight change of topic. Um, so a question focusing on the cargo side of the business. Um, and there are a couple of elements to that. So the, the first is uh, for Willie, what, what do you see as the priorities for uh, cargo and IATA's activity in the cargo area for the rest of 2021? Well, um, you'll be pleased to know that uh, Tony has uh, committed me to speak at an event. Uh, I think it's next week, Tony, is it? It's on the 12th of May uh, right. in relation to uh, cargo. And then uh, later on this year, at the uh, uh, Cargo World Symposium, I think, which is scheduled for the 12th of October. So you're going to hear me talking a lot more about cargo. But just to say that, uh, you know, we are doing a lot of work uh, on um improving cargo performance through uh, digital uh, means. Uh, there has been excellent uh, development in terms of the standards and processes. We've got to now translate that into a change in the way the cargo industry operates. Uh, but uh, I'll have more to say about this when I speak at the event next week. So um, maybe to encourage everybody to uh, attend, uh, you can contact Tony and He'll uh, let you know about the details of that. Perfect. Um, and then the second part of the question is uh, referencing the search for a new head of cargo at IATA. So any progress or updates on, on how that's going? Yes, uh, we continue to make uh, progress on that. Um, I can't say too much because we are in a, a process, but I expect that we'll be making an announcement in relation to that in the very near future. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, I guess just a, a last question. It, it seems that, um, well, actually encouragement for people, if you have more questions, put them in the queue. If not, this will be the last question. Um, it does seem that uh, over the last week, there have been lots of uh, small announcements that seem to be pointing in the right direction in terms of uh, the industry uh, recovery and, and reopening of borders. Um, I guess, Willie, how, how much more optimistic are you this week than you were, say, a couple of weeks ago? Uh, my optimism grows by the day, uh, to be honest with you, and, and that stems from looking at the data. Uh, and the more and more we analyse data, I think the better. And one of the roles that we have in IATA is to ensure that we have good data to uh, support the uh, comments uh, and the arguments that we're making and encourage governments uh, to look at the data and be influenced by the data. You know, I, I hear politicians talking about being influenced by the science. Uh, the science should be influenced by the data, uh, but in many cases, there doesn't appear to be uh, clear evidence of that. So we're encouraged by the data that we're seeing. We will continue to do more research to support the arguments. Uh, and everything we're seeing at the moment uh, points us to being more optimistic about recovery. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have uh, one question that just came in, um, and that's asking or referencing your comments on price gouging by uh, testing or in the testing area. And the question is, who are you referring to? Is it the pharmaceutical companies? Is it the testing companies uh, that are operating on site? Um, and what should governments be doing in terms of intervening in that matter? Yeah, I, I think a whole new industry has built up. So when I look at, uh, you know, I, I take the UK as an example because it's probably the market I'm more familiar with and having travelled to the UK recently and had to go and buy uh, PCR testing, I can see the uh, large number of uh, companies that have been authorised by the UK government. But these are, in many cases, new companies that have, uh, you know, uh, evolved in recent months. They all appear to be um, companies that send the uh, the swabs to a lab. So, you know, what you have now is a, a new industry has built up. Companies who are putting themselves forward as uh, testing um, entities, they're sending you out these swabs so that you can do the tests as required to do. They don't actually test the swab. Uh, that's sent to a lab. Uh, and if you look at the UK government site, you can see many of these identify that they're working with the same lab. Uh, so uh, I think what we've got to do is understand, uh, you know, how do these companies come about? Uh, 
uh, or who's behind them, uh, why are they charging such uh, you know exorbitant prices, given that we know uh, that in many cases uh, they are offering discounts of up to 50%. So if they can offer a discount of up to 50% to uh, some people, why can't they reduce the prices by 50% to all people? Uh, you know, there's uh, clear evidence uh, from what we can see, the wide variation in costs. You know, it's the same test whether you do it in uh, Kuala Lumpur uh, as it is if you uh, do it in Tokyo. And yet the difference in prices is, is enormous. Um, you know, th there isn't a different way of testing. Uh, it's exactly the same way. Um, you know, the, the process is the same wherever you do it. But the variation in price is massive. And it's clear that uh, people are taking advantage of uh, the current health crisis. Um, and so, you know, also very disappointing that we continue to see governments taking their uh, big slice of the pie through charging tax on this. But you know, I, I think if people want evidence, go onto the UK uh, website. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm highlighting them because it's one I'm more familiar with, where they have a list of uh, people who are authorised by the UK government to undertake the testing and uh, look at. Um, you know, where they're sending, because many of them identify the labs, which is the same, uh, but also look at the uh, the prices that they're charging. And you all know, you can do, you can do the work yourself. You know, it, it, it's not rocket science to figure out that the price of one of these swabs is, uh, is not very significant. Uh, putting it into a plastic tube is not significant, and sending it through the post is not significant. Um, and if you look at Again, the UK, the UK government has uh, undertaken 88.2 million PCR tests, according to the government website. I, I doubt that they're paying, um, you know, an average of a hundred US dollars per test. Uh, so everything points to people exploiting this uh, health emergency, uh, which to us is uh, is unacceptable. And, and we really do need uh, governments to step in and say enough is enough. They're mandating the test. You know, they should have, um, well, they, well they, they should step in and ensure that people aren't being ripped off as a result of their uh, mandating PCR test. Great. Thanks, Willie. Um, we've got a, a few more questions that have come into the queue, so we'll continue on for, for a few more minutes, if that's all right. Um, the next question asks about vaccine equity. Um, and I suppose, although there is the option for testing, um, the vast majority, I suppose, of travel would be expected by those who are vaccinated. But given that vaccination distribution amongst countries is uneven, how concerned or are you concerned that that could impact the recovery? It's, it's a great issue. Uh, I share that concern and it's the reason why we've been very clear. Vaccination should not be the only key. Uh, you know, it, 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 there will be a, a difference clear differentiation in the way that vaccines are being rolled out. Uh, people who have not been able to access vaccines, either because they're not available in their country, um, because the country doesn't have sufficient supplies, or they're unable to take the vaccine, should not be prevented from flying. And that's why we acknowledge in the short term that testing does have a role to play. Um, and as we go forward, where levels of transmission have significantly reduced, I think you have to question whether even the current level of testing is required. But it's very important that uh, people do not fall into the trap of believing that the only way to go flying in the future will be if you're vaccinated. That That is unacceptable. That would be unfair. Uh, and I, I would imagine politicians should be the first people to stand up and say we're not going to allow that to happen. Okay. Um, we have a, another topic related to the restart, which concerns uh, our partners in the airport sector. Um, and the question is, first off, do you see rising airport charges as a trend? Um, and if so, what are your plans to combat that or ensure that it doesn't happen? Well, I'm 41 years in the industry, and I don't think I can recall a situation where airport charges went down. Uh, so normally rising airport charges has been a feature of the industry. It's why, you know, many airlines and airline associations and IATA were highlighting this as a critical issue that needed to be tackled. Um, it is a great concern uh, because, you know, what we have seen in the past is that airlines that can exercise monopoly or quasi-monopoly power 
do so. Uh, they need to be effectively regulated. Um, we still see evidence that regulators are soft when it comes to airport regulations. Even where we have regulators in place, they don't always act in the interests of the consumer uh, because they believe they need to provide incentives to uh, airports to invest uh, properly. I, I just struggle to understand why any competent business person uh, would need to uh, be incentivized like that. It's, it's to me, it's a very, you know, the most basic and fundamental principle of doing business that you try and do so in the most efficient way possible. So uh, it is of concern. Uh, we are very focused on it. But we will continue to highlight evidence when it becomes available to us of airports that we think are behaving inappropriately. And I, I go back to what I've said before. It must be in the interest of everybody in the supply chain to see the industry recover. Airports have no value if you're not getting customers through the airports. You know, we've, we've always argued that, uh, you know, the uh, duty-free shops in airports only exist because airlines are flying passengers from A to B. Uh, if there are no passengers there, those duty-free shops are, are closed. So uh, we need to see um, everyone recognizing that the most important issue now is for the airline industry to get back up to full speed as quickly as possible uh, so that everybody in the supply chain can benefit. Okay, thanks, Willie. Um, we have a, a slightly different question. In the middle of this crisis, we're seeing some airlines start up. And uh, the questioner is asking, what's your opinion of, of these, uh, their prospects for being successful? And would, I suppose, would you do it yourself? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I would pick now to uh, start an airline. Um, yeah, I, I can see why some people believe they're attracted to it. But uh, honestly, if, if you look at it, you know, the airline industry was very competitive. You know, you've heard me talk about it before, brutally competitive. Coming through this, pretty much every airline will be more efficient than they were going into it because all airlines have been forced to tackle areas of inefficiency and to accelerate uh, plans that they've had to become uh, more efficient because that's in the nature of our business. Because of competition, everybody is always striving to become uh, more efficient, to lower their cost base where they have controllable costs. Uh, so um, the uh, you know potential advantage that a startup would have uh, is, in my opinion, not uh, great. In fact, in many cases, given the lack of scale, uh, uh, there's going to be no advantage. In fact, a significant disadvantage. But it's nice to see uh, because it keeps us all healthy, uh, keeps all airlines on their toes. And, you know, where there are people who believe they can uh, succeed in the industry, I, I'm not going to discourage them. Um, but, you know, what we do need to ensure is that uh, consumers are protected and that consumers are smart and that, you know, consumers don't get sucked into uh, buying um, for, uh, you know, tickets from an airline that clearly has no prospect of being viable and surviving. Okay, thanks, Willie. Um, we have uh, one potentially last question, which is just asking about the situation in Latin America, um, particularly in Brazil. Um, so I don't know, maybe Brian from the economic side, do you want to start? And then Willie, if there's more general comments on Latin America? Uh, right, okay. Uh, I mean, we, the Brazilian domestic market is obviously so important for, you know, airlines in, in the Latin American uh, region. And you know, that had been a relatively robust market. Um, but with the difficulties that we're seeing with uh, one of the variants of the uh, of the virus, obviously that has you know, set back the improvements in, um, in that particular region. Well, anything you'd like to add on the Latin American situation? No, just to reinforce what Brian has said, uh, you know, clearly um, very challenging for the airlines there, but all of them restructuring. Uh, so again, uh, going back to what I said earlier, coming through this, uh, those that survive, and they will survive, uh, will come out of this crisis in a stronger position. And may maybe just to finish, uh, you know, you, most people know that I like quoting from um, Irish writers. Uh, so here's one from George Bernard Shaw, which I thought is appropriate. Uh, he said that both optimists and pessimists contribute to society. 
the optimist invented the airplane, the pessimist, the parachute. So, um, yeah, I, I'm an optimist. Uh, I think I've good reason to be optimistic and I've never used a parachute. Great. Well, on that note, I think we'll call this uh, briefing to a close. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Uh,